Amazing. So hello, guys. I hope you're all well and having a great week. Tonight, Middlesex University Product Design, Product Design Engineering and Design Engineering are really excited to host the 16th talk in the annual guest lecture series. So this series runs weekly throughout the academic year on Thursday evenings, bringing together a vibrant mix of speakers from across the full spectrum of design and engineering. A mix of leading practitioners, opinion leaders, radical thinkers and emerging talents to inspire and support your professional development. Tonight, we're excited to host uh, Mimi Wen. So Mimi's an associate lecturer on the MA Innovation Management Program at Central St. Martins. She's also a PhD candidate at the Dyson School of Design Engineering in the Faculty of Engineering at Imperial College London. And Mimi's research seeks to improve shared mental models in virtual collaborations to enhance creativity and innovation amongst diverse teams. Mimi's background is in tech consulting. She has experience in fintech startups, in game development, and working with high profile organizations such as Accenture and the Boston Consulting Group. Previously, Mimi studied uh, media arts at University of Arts Berlin. She also has a MA in Innovation Management at CSM and also a bachelor's degree in Quantitative Methods and Information Systems from the Warsaw School of Economics. So guys, as usual, feel free to gather your thoughts, your questions, your comments in the chat throughout the talk, and we'll have Q&A at the end. There's also the option to go live and interact after the main talks. And without any further ado, over to Mimi with a talk, Moody Man, Improving Creative Teamwork Through Dynamic Effective Recognition. All yours, Mimi. Oh, thanks so much for the introduction. Uh, it's quite intimidating listening to that introduction myself now. I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> who is that person? But I um, hope I will, I'll, I'll go for that background in a bit as well. But uh, I wanted to use this opportunity actually to present to you my, my latest research, actually. It's um, my last study uh, in my PhD. And um, this will be a presentation kind of that has been presented also at the conference before you can see here Tokyo Tech, uh, which unfortunately was online, uh, but I was very looking forward to go to Tokyo. And we will present this paper again in New Orleans and that's in person. So I'm very looking forward to do that in um, end of April. So that's it's a Kai conference. Um, but yeah, uh, just I thought that it might be uh, quite interesting to, for you to see like, you know, how, how can a PhD end up with as a study? Uh, this is a research that um, I've done in collaboration, uh, about collaboration, funnily. So um, I uh, teamed up with uh, Milad from Coventry University. He is actually a BA student, but he's a, a software developer, basically, and I just really needed someone uh, who could code for me. Um, and of course, we partner with IBM Research. Uh, which uh, wasn't like a big, uh, um, an obvious thing at the beginning, uh, but we managed to speak to both IBM Research in state, so that's BC, Kwon, and, and, and John, who is um, in the IBM Research uh, in the UK, and of course, Celine is my supervisor. So these are the authors of, of the paper. Uh, as, as Ahmed said, it's, it's Moody Man. Uh, it's an app that we created and I named it Moody Man. It's uh, looking into how can we improve not performance, but creativity in remote teams uh, using uh, affective recognition. So um, anything about emotional AI and, and all this stuff. I have no idea how to move to the next slide now. Cool. Uh, so as, as Ahmed said, a few words about myself. I worked firstly in consulting. So uh, I was working in um, kind of like management consulting strategy consulting, but what we were doing mainly uh, in, in both of these organizations were implementing a lot of tech in financial system, uh, services. So in banks, insurance companies. Uh, and what happened is that through working with this in these organizations and, and on the projects, I realized that it was not innovative enough. So we are just implementing some tech solutions, but we're not really changing the way people behave, the way people collaborate, the way people work. Uh, so I moved to London uh, to study at CSM because I thought that I wanted to study something um, more creative um, and ended up in game development and in fintech. So. Uh, at that time, kind of, it was quite interesting to join the fintech scene, startup scene in London, 2014, uh, to see how the small companies using, um, we didn't use the word AI at the time, we used the word machine learning, basically, to change the, uh, the way SMEs or small medium enterprises can obtain loans. Uh, so if you remember the movie 
the founder about McDonald's. Uh, people used to just go from a bank to a bank with a suitcase and then wait three months to get a loan approval, have all the credit checks. And the, um, the thesis and the promise of that fintech that I was working for, it was it's called Iwoka, uh, is to use algorithms and machine learning in order to do the credit check in 24 hours and give the decision about the loan um, in the same day and basically the same day as the, the fund. So that, that was kind of the, the promise. And um, they're quite big now. They have in serious C or D with like over 200 people, almost 300 people. Uh, and it was just a great uh, experience for me to learn how can a small organization at that time when I joined them was 30 people uh, really disrupt the whole banking uh, industry. And that was really exciting. Uh, and then I moved to game development. Um, this maybe might not be updated, but yeah. So uh, I started the PhD at Imperial it was very, with, with Ahmed uh, and uh, we kind of merging the two worlds of tech and design. So something that's super exciting for me. I think that's what you guys are doing as well. Uh, I think, um, and actually I heard that from some of the professors from Harvard uh, Business School uh, that are creating the syllabus of the MBA that this is the future. Kind of not just business, not just tech, but merging all of these words together. They're in introducing design thinking into their modules as well. Uh, and I think that's, that's something that it's, um, that excites me, kind of merging this, this uh, few things. I joined UCL this year as well as a lecturer, <coughs> again, merging towards strategy and design. And it's quite fun uh, to bring these two things together. Cool, so um, let's start with the whole research interest. Uh, my PhD is, uh, was supposed to look at the multidisciplinary collaboration. So um, again, something that I, experience myself working uh, at, in the middle of different teams, especially when I was uh, in game development, I had to work with designers, the UX designers, UI designers, um, the tech people, software the, uh, engineers, and of course the business people who were paying for the whole project. So they would have business specifications. We had to match that uh, and I was product owner. So I, had, I was in between the business part and, um, and the production part, uh, really trying to manage these three different words together uh, and at the meetings, I always um, realized that they all speak different languages, they all have different expectations, different modes of working, different styles of working, and there were a lot of clashes. So you can see that, especially right now in the blockchain space, so as an example that really fascinates me, it's for example, fashion companies who are entering the metaverse space, you will have, um, I'm speaking recently to head of metaverse in Balenciaga, and, you know, just, just understanding that it's a fashion company that actually is now building up a whole department, the metaverse department with VR developers, gaming developers, uh, all of these tech people and plus uh, money people. So kind of heavily people into blockchain and crypto. Uh, and I think it will be fascinating to, to see how all of these teams will collaborate together and, and how can we actually help them to become uh, not efficient, not uh, to perform better because I understand in that meaning when we talk about improvement of performance it's sometimes just the speed of work uh, but that doesn't mean and it's not synonymous to creativity or uh, kind of a level of innovation that the, the teamwork can achieve. So um, yeah starting from like a very basic question how can diverse teams um, how can they work in the future so basically how multidisciplinary design collaboration can affect the future of work. Uh, and this has been divided throughout the PhD into uh, smaller parts um, through looking at, I don't know if you can see that here, let me, ah, okay. Um, I started with kind of traditional re literature review looking into just uh, design teamwork. And what came out um, were two findings, one is that shared understanding, shared cognition is one of the most important aspects in such teamwork. And of course, previous research hasn't been uh, sufficient uh, in order to understand how distributed teamwork works. And it's clearly because remote working wasn't as popular um, in design studies. You would have architects working in the same room. Uh, so, so there's not that much paper that is focusing specifically on creativity and remote working. Uh, they happen, they, they kind of popped out over the last few years. 
uh, but you know the foundation papers from the 80s uh, all the offers that we, we we know from the design studies they usually look at uh, students um, designers put together in a room in a lab and they put cameras around them and trying to understand how they collaborate but I think what also we, we found in the study um, people work slightly different remotely and um, so I, I focus on distributed collaboration and how can we um, improve shared cognition and why I think it's important because a lot of previous research about shared understanding and shared cognition is focusing on the fact that we all should think the same because it's called shared cognition. So the aim of it is that we are bringing all of our worldviews to one and we're merging that and we're trying to uh, converge our thinking like this in the double diamond. But if we talk about creativity, uh, it's kind of um, the opposite of it because we're trying to diverge our thinking uh, and be as diverse as possible in order to create more ideas with the premise that uh, the more ideas we have, we will be able to select a better one from a bigger pool. Uh, so I see myself a conflict in understanding of like, you know, how much of the shared cognition do we actually need to share in order to be still, to, to still keep the level of um, creativity and how does this is being affected in the remote working. Uh, how is that being done is I decided to interview uh, a lot of people from the industry who are working in multidisciplinary teams. Uh, that includes a lot of people from design consultancies, architects. Um, and what happened is that we started the study in 2000, end of 2019 uh, and, and lockdown happened. So it was very interesting for me to enter this phase of the study exactly the moment when the whole world went into shutdown and every single person that um, was working previously in a hybrid mode or actually was not even thinking to join my study because they were working in a physical space. Uh, it opened up to me a lot of uh, opportunities and also I learned a lot of way more interesting things um, talking to these people because during the lockdown a lot of frustrations came out uh, about remote working. So I think normally when you have the vision of the fact that you can work remote, but sometimes you can still pop into the office uh, to, to have a, a, a water cooler talk with your colleague or have a nice lunch with your colleague, it slightly takes your perspective into distributed collaboration slightly differently, uh, comparing when suddenly everyone is remote right now and no one was prepared to that. One of the examples like when I spoke to Foster and Partners, um, really trying to understand like how architects dealing now with uh, working remotely and they said that it was a disaster because they lost all the walls when they were doing all the post-its. We all love post-its because we're in design engineering and the moment when there are no post-its and it's just powerpoints, uh, a lot of issues can, uh, can uh, un be unearthed. Uh, unearthed. Um, so all these frustrations um, were exaggerated through COVID, but also what was interesting for me is to do this research in an environment that all my interviewees were at home. So I suspect that my data would be slightly skewed if I would be interviewing them in person or in their offices or even on a Zoom when they are still in the office. But however, when the moment when the person interview is in the bedroom, uh, they, they could open up way more about um, their working environment. And uh, what I'm trying to do with that study, it's 46 people. Um, and the study was published by Time Magazine later, kind of post COVID. Uh, uh, I got a lot of backlash from that because I said that remote working doesn't work. And of course the whole Twitter space just hated me because no one really wants to work. No one wants to travel to other offices. Uh, and yeah, so I kind of learned that sometimes if you publish a study and it's something controversial, uh, you can get a lot of backlash from the masses. Um, and what we're trying to do now is I, I will plan to go back to these people and um, redo the interviews with them once they are back to the office. What I already noticed interesting is like half of my participants left their companies. And this study, turned now from a study about remote working into a study about organizational identification, 
how do we identify ourselves as our employers? Um, and does remote working affects this identification and to what scale that people are even, you know, we, we all had hearing about this great resignation thing. And um, that kind of leads to what I found out from that study, which is that remote working is all good and great um, when we talk about four uh, free aspects of shared understanding. So there are four aspects, um, which is task specific knowledge, task related knowledge, team knowledge and attitudes and beliefs. So these are the four blocks of shared understanding. And through these interviews, we uh, found out that three of them are being quite well served by existing um, solutions that we're having on the market. So for task specific knowledge, so when we speak specifically about one thing, what I notice is um, emails or um, JIRA boards, anything that it's like very, concise about one particular small task and we just really need to solve uh, quickly a, a question about that. When we talk about something task related knowledge or something around the task, people tend to use video conferencing. So then this is where we go on Zooms and then we discuss on a higher level about the project. And uh, the third area is team knowledge. So we identified that um, people are using Slack a lot for uh, team knowledge. So, you know, this is when the casual informal conversations can happen. We try to kind of learn a little bit more about our teammates, our colleagues, <coughs> but the fourth block, which is attitudes, beliefs. And I um, expand this notion, this construct into engagement and mood. And that's uh, kind of the feedback that I got from the study. Um, we can't really get that from Slack or even from the video conferencing. You don't really know uh, what is my mood today, really. I don't know. Maybe if you can guess from looking at me, but I basically slept two hours today um, because I had some medical issues. Like I lost my contact lenses in my eyes. But again, like that's the thing, like you don't really see that for the, the Zoom. Uh, and what happened is that people couldn't really understand their colleagues through this remote working solutions, um, especially what is the mood of the colleague and whether the person is engaged or not. And then I guess I'm not going to call, uh, okay, I'm just gonna call you out right now, but you guys have your cameras off. And this is something that I'm seeing quite often in teaching, uh, especially during the lockdown. If the camera is off, it means that you just went off, boiled your kettle and possibly eating dinner right now. Uh, which is completely fine to me. I do that with YouTube, I eat pizza on YouTube, but that doesn't mean that you're working. And all of my interviews were saying like, you know, they were on Zoom calls with the cameras off in the same time having emails and doing some other task. Uh, and the whole level of engagement um, was gone. And I think this kind of relates a lot into this organizational identification and also, you know, how can we actually contribute to the teamwork in a creative way if our minds are someone else trying to just respond on Slack on, or on emails. Uh, <coughs> so back to the study. <clears throat> I speak too much. Um, I thought that I'll work with Slack because it has 10 million active daily users. So it's something that it's the leader on the market. And um, another reason for choosing Slack is it has quite an open uh, developer environment. So you can build an app for Slack um, as opposed to Microsoft Teams, which has quite close um, environment in order to like build anything on top of that and integrate that into the application. So, so I decided to use Slack. Again, why are your Slack? A lot of studies about you know, engagement, mood, attitude, so effective recognition, that's how they call it. Um, in the AI space, it's to solve video conferencing which is all great. I mean, I don't have anything against, apart from the fact that we don't really spend eight hours on Zoom. Um, I mean, during the lockdown we did, but after the lockdown, I don't know, maybe max we're spending three hours daily, but five hours we do spend on text communication. So it's still emails, it's still Slack, it's still even chat on Microsoft Teams. So I'm trying to solve something that actually is affecting us on a bigger scale than, you know, um, some Zoom calls. Uh, and I chose text communication. And it's also way more challenging to solve something about mood, emotion, attitudes, beliefs, engagement via text, like written text, 
uh, because here you completely don't have any cues, any visual, you have no idea what the person on the other side is feeling um, or, or, you know, uh, how is their day. So um, we looked uh, into uh, leveraging natural language processing and how can we scan the text of Slack uh, and use that to support our study participants with um, effective recognition. So understanding the tone, the sentiment of the message and understanding the emotions that the message would um, convey. Back to, yeah, so this is something that I talked through before, the study that went to time. So these three blocks that I mentioned were um, supported in the tools and the attitude is the one that is challenged. It's quite messy here, but this is the framework that came up from the interviews. Uh, so we could see that there are some, this is a whole short cognition, four blocks of that, and challenge in computer mediated communication. So CMC, it's are just two parts. And I'm focusing in the study just on the attitudes and beliefs, because I believe that this is um, being accentuated in remote working and we can't really find out about co-worker familiarity, what is co-worker personality and what is the co-worker mood, as I said before. Uh, <coughs> so um, the quote from Homer, I thought that it's quite funny. We too, if we could ever think as one, the children uh, every day would be postponed no longer. Uh, so again, kind of reminding back into collaboration. I normally started the paper with the quote from the Bible, but I got kind of told off by reviewers. So I went with the Homer. Uh, and yeah, I mean, it's the same stories, right? Like when we talk about the Tower of ba Babel and like how communication uh, is important. And, you know, when people were trying to build that tower up to the sky, God got really upset with that and he uh, brought he gave um, us different languages so that people could not communicate with each other. And by that, the whole build of the Babel Tower has been seized because we all speak different languages. So that's kind of a metaphor that I, I kind of like, like to go back. Um, so this is the app um, that we built. Um, hmm. In the easy language, how it looks like, um, the user would send a message to Slack and Slack would then push the message to our app, uh, which was called Moodyman app, that would again send the content of the message into our database where we saved every single message that had been sent throughout the, um, the study. Uh, it could send back to the app um, all the information with uh, the uh, with the content and that has been later parsed through um, IBM Watson it's called natural language understanding so that's kind of like an off-the-shelf solution that they have uh, with the sentiment analyzer and emotion detector uh, parsed through that algorithm uh, sent back to slack and um, this is kind of like on demand so if the user wants to learn about the message sentiment which means tone or the emotion, they would submit a call, which I will show later. So you'd kind of like choose um, an app on Slack. It will open the model, which is a pop-up on Slack and show you uh, what is the tone of the message and what emotions the message um, is um, portraying according to the IBM Watson NLU. Again, all of this information is sent back to our database, so we're saving all of these things. And I'll tell you later why we did that as well. So this is how it looks like in real life. Uh, this is the Slack. Uh, we put all the participants in um, 15 teams. So there were Diaz uh, working on a design brief, um, quite popular, easy to work on, future of mobility. So they had one hour to discuss within with a stranger. So this was done with participants from five UK universities. I don't really remember now. It was Imperial, RCA, Royal College of Art, uh, University of Sheffield, UCL, and University of Manchester. <coughs> Sorry. And 
they would collaborate on Slack together on that brief. So they didn't, they couldn't talk on um, any video conferencing together, just use text communication, uh, which was quite surprising because everyone was um, really annoyed about, but um, I was like, this is the reality. Like if you work in a real environment, this is how you communicate with your colleagues. And whenever you send a message, you could actually hover on it and then choose the Moody Man app. And then it would send a pop-up that would show you the taunt. For example, this message was 75% positive uh, and the score, whether it's sad, whether it's joyful, fearful, whether it's disgusting, or is it angry message uh, with some percentages. Uh, and what, why we also use Slack is because it enabled us to do this app in a way that people really didn't know that it was a prototype. Like once you're inside the, the collaboration, uh, I think all of our participants kind of had a feeling that this is a Slack solution. Uh, and why is that? It's because when you do any research, any experiments, there is something called the Hawthorne effect, which means that when people know that it's an experiment or when people know that they're being observed, they behave differently. Uh, they could, I don't know, speak more positively or, or things like that. So um, by using Slack uh, as, as our um, app, we could slightly minimize this um, effect because no one really knew that it, it was just a, just a prototype built, especially for the study. Um, so what we did is for the first 30 minutes, uh, the participants didn't know about the Moody Man, so they were just talking freely. And then after ha half an hour, uh, I introduced them to the app. So I explained to them like, now you can check uh, how your message look like, how your message can sound using this um, button, this click. And um, after 30 minutes, so I call it before intervention phase, we did a questionnaire and then we did the same questionnaire half an hour later um, after they were introduced to the app and kind of asked to use the app. So we did uh, pre-test, post-test post -test questionnaires, uh, this kind of study, which has limitations because it means that it's a within subject study. I, the reason why I didn't do between subject study, which means that I didn't have a control group with placebos or like, you know, like a completely separate group that never used Moodyman and the group who used Moodyman, that's clearly from the funding issues. I just didn't have enough money to get 60 people. Uh, so we kind of use this intervention uh, experiment uh, style. And yeah, as I mentioned, use pre-test, post-test um, questions. And of course, um, we introduce some uh, extra measures um, to, to at least try to um, minimize any limitations from this within subject methodology. Uh, one of this is using the questionnaires, the questions from existing literature. So we measure shared mental models, attitude, creativity, um, creative process engagement from studies that verified the metrics already and it's all Likert scale. Uh, and of course, at the end of the intervention, uh, we use a metric about app evaluation just to see what people think about the app itself. Um, so what happened or the result is um, the all went up with uh, a significant, statistically uh, significant increase. So we run all the statistics on that uh, and can't really see that here. That's why like, we had to run the stats uh, additionally just to double check whether all these numbers went up and they did went up um, with the significance P less than 0 0.05. Uh, so this is all good. But the app evaluation, as you can see, was kind of like in the middle. No one was really like kind of sure, like do they like the app or not? Um, so that gave us a great excuse to go back to the participants and talk to them. And we, so in this case, we now did a mixed methods research. We did a quantitative one through the questionnaires uh, and we did a qualitative one uh, after the study. And this is more just the data structure that came out from the interview. So we did one hour interview with each participant, one dropped out, so we're 29 particip participants in the interviews, one hour once. Uh, and then we identified um, different patterns uh, for speaking to them. Uh, what happened is 
we I can run through quickly that just have some weird stuff. Yeah. Um, we identify two massive themes uh, from the interviews. One is um, design goals. So um, basically, what went wrong, and but I name it design goals, and motivation, what went well. Uh, with design goals, so what went wrong means that these are the aspects that we should look for when we're designing future AI tools that are supposed to uh, support text communication. Uh, one of them is AI design itself, so the design of the algorithm itself. Um, there was a lack of complexity of emotions, so as you could see before the IBM Watson NLU would just identify six emotions and our participants kind of raise the um, need that they would like to actually learn more about the nuanced emotions. So they would like to learn if someone is trying to hit on them or is trying someone to be virtuous on the conversation or if someone is being passive aggressive. So it's kind of nuanced emotions, which um, it's kind of like a future work uh, that we are recommending for um, any researchers in the space to look into kind of the complexity. Another one uh, issue was the timing of the delivery. So um, the information about this um, affective um, feedback was done after the message was sent. And uh, you, know, you, you all know Grammarly, I guess, um, every participant would prefer to see these things before they hit the button send. Um, and that's something that we couldn't build into Slack due to just technical reasons and feasibility. Um, Slack doesn't have the option to send something to the database before you click send. Uh, so this is also the reason possible that you don't see Grammarly in Slack. Uh, and, and maybe if we would do that in Google Docs, possibly that could be an option, but this is something that also came up quite recently, I think last year, Grammar, Grammarly can be integrated into in Gmail and stuff. Uh, so a lot of this are kind of limited by the tech itself, that it's quite hard to do it before. A lot of studies that were focusing on affective recognition in the video conferencing, conferencing space are actually giving the feedback after the call, which it's completely the opposite of what we found in our research, because a lot of our participants said that if the meeting happened, they don't really need the feedback anymore because what has been done is been done. Like you can't go back to the call and then say sorry to the person. So um, they do uh, push for the fact to learn about all of these things, dynamic affective recognition before even, you know, uh, the things have been sent. Um, there's a issue of trust in AI. So what is the accuracy of the AI? Uh, how has been the data trained on? Were they trained on native people, native English speakers? Or were they trained on non-native? So a lot of like kind of black box magic that is around AI. And of course, a big question about UX itself. Um, they would prefer to see the stuff on the hover instead of having to click stuff. So that's basically a UX issue when designing AI tools and data presentation itself. So this is more like about UI. Um, they didn't understand the percentages. So, uh, so they would prefer to see something more visual. Uh, not numbers. Uh, so that's, you know, something uh, quite good to learn about. Another one, of course, uh, issue was the impression management. So self-awareness of the fact that you are being observed by AI and being judged by AI kind of uh, raises um, some questions as well. But then we can move to the good stuff. So the good stuff, of course, and this is something that I didn't plan to identify in the study, but it came out quite a lot is the role of emojis. Emojis play kind of quite important role in our text communication nowadays. We can bridge um, kind of different uh, dynamics uh, that are happening in this collaboration. We can quickly uh, react or acknowledge something. So when you have the thumbs up em emoticon and things like that, it's caricatures of the emotions. <coughs> so you have this crying out la uh, from laughing face. Uh, and it basically reveals emotions. So this is something that helps in building this um, affection in the remote working. Usage points, um, which means when should this AI be used? This is something that we also learned from the interviews. Uh, it's useful for bigger teams. So less useful for pairs, 
um, whenever we have kind of like group chats on Slack, this could be quite useful because this is where the conflicts can actually arise and it's quite messy. Uh, it's quite good for the idea evaluation. So uh, when people are trying to really kind of not just throw in random ideas, but then evaluate ideas at the end. So kind of closer to the selection process, this is when they would use that tool. Um, and another one is user type. So this AI, the motivation for using this tool is defined by who is using the tool. So of course the culture, so if you are, let's say a native speaker and then you work in a native speaking uh, group, you wouldn't use this. They, 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 the participants said that they wouldn't use the tool. Whereas if they know that there is someone from a different culture, this is exactly where they would use that because they want to check, um, double check whether or not they are being understood correctly. Uh, if someone is a non-native speaker, they would also use that. And I personally would use that myself because I am from Poland and sometimes my language is quite strong. And I do hear comments that I seem quite strict on text communication. So sometimes I laugh that I have to use it to myself because I'm just like always up protected. My message doesn't sound super angry and like an Eastern European person. Uh, and when you have people coming from different um, disciplines, then uh, they would also use that. The biggest find for me was impression formation. That's something that I didn't expect to find. And it all turns out to be that we all care so much about what people think about us and maybe that's a generational thing, but everyone said that this is the tool when they would use, when they care about how they come across. So if we talk to someone, uh, a figure of authority, so our boss, our professor, um, if we really want to portray ourselves in a better way, so let's say we're a newcomer in the company and we just want to like, you know, be friends with everyone. Uh, and that links to also speaking to strangers. So. It's kind of like showed the obsession uh, uh, nowadays that we have to form our image to other people. And this is when, you know, throughout all of this mistrust to AI, they would still use the tool because they care so much about uh, how they come across. So that's, that's the finding that uh, I think uh, for me personally was the most striking. Uh, and the last thing that we did, uh, triangulation of the study. So, um, let's say that one of the limitations was the fact that people knew that they are being observed or that they are in the study experiment, so they would try to change the behavior, uh, or people kind of lie in the interviews because they just basically don't remember. Um, it's called retrospective bias. Uh, so I did the triangulation, so it's called like extra verification of um, the findings. Uh, we just basically took all the text that we got, divided into T1 and T2, and measured the sentiment and the emotion of the text itself without even asking people. So kind of really objectively trying to see like, is the text that people sent using the, um, the tool is more positive? And everything went up. There are like some numbers here. So the sadness, sadness um, went down anger went down, but then sentiment, so the tone was more positive. Again, we checked that with the statistical significance and the p-value was even lower. So kind of um, a striking result that the, the, the tone and the emotions were more positive um, once introduced with the tool. Um, so yeah, some of the quotes uh, from the interviews that kind of were striking for me. So um, maybe in a formal application, when you want to come across like in a professional manner, or we want to know it before you send it, um, you'd refrain from doing something because you're worried about what it might say as a new employee, as I mentioned before, as a new newcomer. And if you are texting someone like, um, if you want to come, you don't want to come across a bit too sloppy. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of perfectly leaving some buffer space. Uh, that's that's the result from the study, and yeah, hope, hopefully maybe one day uh, I'll actually come and use that into Slack, and maybe some people can have fun with it. 
amazing 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 Mimi. it was a fantastic talk uh both of yourself and a quick overview of of yourself and your you know education and your career so far alongside the the ongoing research and and the paper that you're presenting is, is superb um guys uh, feel free to continue to gather your thoughts your questions and your comments in the chat and if you want to go on live and interact with Mimi as well, then please obviously put a request in the chat and we'll definitely make it happen. There's quite a few questions coming through, so let's uh, start spinning through them. Oh, wow. um, first and foremost, um, Kai Stockford's asking, what would you say the hardest part of starting an app and the app design is? <coughs> um, is that in the chat? Just it's in the chat, to... yeah. How do I open the chat? God. Um... Okay, there are questions. Um, starting an app is, uh, for me, feasibility. So I had a lot of, you know, uh, dreams about this app uh, and a lot of things I couldn't just do um, because of the environment that we were coding in. So when I started to, co to, to create this app, I actually wanted to even make it physical in a way that it was supposed to be built with like a machine that would have like lights just for fun and have like a nice bot around you. And that was supposed to be for our degree show basically at Imperial. Uh, but A, I couldn't get the materials and it was quite messy. But the the, the most frustrating thing that um, I, I we had with designing this app was, so when we did that, it's with IBM, but actually throughout the whole design process we were in constant contact with slack and i i think i turned out to be like the most annoying person that would just email them every day and ask him stupid questions and they would just go back and say no you can't do that you can't do that because i kept asking them like can we have this on hover please like just like grammarly and they're like no you have to do this 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 click click um but um i think so the, the most annoying thing is like you you think that you can design something and I, I, I did that I have that in the game development as well like you would have the business people coming like we want this game to be like this and then the developer like no it's not going to happen like no it's just impossible like there's no processing power that can calculate this amount of probabilities that you want in your casino machine game so let's say like you have slot machines and if you want 10 slots like imagine like how many um in a tree decision like how many options can happen and then you need a lot of like you know um processing uh power to to run that through and of course if you think about your users they would not have this strong machines that can run you know 10 slot machines in the same time and everything is run through javascript for example because or html5 so a lot is like limited by the technology that you can do and then you need to adjust your brief according to that and um yeah, and that's quite frustrating because uh, you have to then part with your dream and then just yeah, stick to what you can do. Amazing. And in, in light of that, um, what um, programs or software would you use in terms of the prototyping? So we use Python for this. Um, again, why it was quite messy is because it was run by a local server machine. So actually like during the experiments that you know, all of the sending to the database, sending to the Slack server, sending to the IBM server, it was run on my laptop and it was like super hot. So whenever there was this experiment, the guys were like talking on Slack on the laptops and they, they, they were just not aware that all these calculations were on my laptop and I couldn't close it. So I was kind of panicking that I would lose Wi-Fi, I would lose access to the server because uh, everything's calculated on my thing. Again, if you would do it on the cloud, uh, which is doable, but then you'll have to pay for that. And uh, although we did get grants from IBM to run it on the cloud, it was just way easier to run it on the local machine. Uh, so, so yeah, so we coded that in Python um, in the terminal, basically in a terminal on the Mac. So everything locally, um, nothing, it wasn't in like in the production phase that, you know, that's why, that's why this is not released for the public because otherwise I had to host everything on the cloud and just basically pay for that to, for the server to run all the time, um, which uh, is something I we, we, we don't really think about because it's, it's all in the background. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And a, a question coming in from Kiara. Kiara is asking, um, how do you determine the t tone of the message and how accurate the tone is? 
Exactly. So this is something that the participants ask. I don't know. Ask IBM. Um, I think they 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 had some issues before. Um, they did one package um, which was specifically with emotions, and they have to withdraw that because I think there was too much backlash uh, about the whole affective recognition. But in terms of how do you um, determine that, I think like every AI, it's, this is basically run and trained by previous data sets. So I assume I, IBM just collected like hundreds of thousands, millions of texts um, that has been classified, whether it's positive, negative, neutral, divided that into two data sets. One is the one that has built the whole algorithm. When you're trying to match as close as possible to how it has been classified, and then you test that model on the training data set to double check whether your model is lying or not. And that's how any yeah, AI solution works. Amazing. And then um, in light of that as well, um, what, what are your thoughts around the accuracy of the, um, of the interpretation by the ABM, uh, IBM algorithms? So for example, like, you know, like Grammarly where it kind of highlights yeah. and, and it shows you suggestions and then obviously you can verify, you can make the changes. Um, you know, if, if it's, uh, you know, classifying and categorizing something as positive or negative or, you know, frustrating or something like this. Mm -hmm. um, and, and maybe that's not the intended um, tone of communication, for example. Um, that, that <coughs> is there an option for the, the, the user to then change the input or, you know, like re rephrase something before sending it in, in the textual communication? Uh, I, ha I have to find your exact numbers. There is a paper which is measuring accuracy and precision mm -hmm. for all of the off-the-shelf um, solutions, Google Cloud, IBM Watson, other solutions, uh, I guess Amazon has as well. And IBM had the highest precision number, I would say. It was around 71%. Um, and I mean, there were different kind of um, aspects that they were measuring. And IBM was the highest ranked. I think that would up to 80% uh, of the accuracy in terms of negative tone. So if you we would use Google Cloud for that, then it would jump down to 62% in terms of negative, which actually in our case was better to focus on the negative because we're trying to make sure that people are aware when they're being mean on the text. Okay. So if, if the priority is the, the negative tone and the accuracy to that, then across all of different solutions, IBM had the highest one, and I do think it's around 71% mm -hmm. of accuracy. Amazing. And then a, a question that perhaps links quite nicely to that from Kiara is, is this app only for English? And does the difference in language affect the understanding of tone um, within text? Yes. So this is just English, unfortunately. Uh, I don't have information again whether this is based on native english um i assume not i assume ibm had enough data that it that consider text that is written by non-native speakers uh but yeah this is just english i know that google has other languages as well they they kind of like big on that so for sure they would have chinese i would assume uh, but then again if we want to talk about other languages my only concern is that you know, you can have it for German and, and stuff, but the data set that this has been trained on will be way more limited than English because they just don't have, they, they haven't collected enough data from this particular language. So the accuracy in foreign language would be even lower. So I don't know, maybe that will be even 50%. I when we have 50, 50, doesn't really matter like what the person said. So um, yeah, unfortunately, I think the English is, is best for research because it's the most robust data set that has been, that any algorithm has been tested on. Amazing. And on, on that note as well, uh, what about if like English is your second language and for example, you know, you, you've got the correct phrase or the correct term, you know, like uh, that you want to say, but you don't know how to quite translate to English. And then when you, the, the English communication obviously uh, um, has a different meaning to perhaps what you've intended based on the translation. Is there any like kind of re research or accuracy in, in that particular translation? No, I don't, there is some I saw recently. Um, 
when there is an AI that was trying to jump between, this is very interesting because there was a research of people who are speaking English, but throwing Chinese words. Mm -hmm. So the AI had to like quickly switch and you know, you never know when the person would just, just throw that. And I do that sometimes when I speak to my friends, um, I would speak in Polish, but then I would throw an English word because you know I, I just remember the word in English. And um, I do it with my mom sometimes when I speak Vietnamese and I have to throw some words in Polish uh, to her. So yeah, I don't think there is, we have now, we are at the stage from like you know, technological development uh, that this can resolve this jumping between languages and to serve native speakers. However, I do think that if you are a non-native speaker and you're speaking in English, this could be quite useful because at least you can see how a native person would perceive you. Mm -hmm. So, as I said, I, I, my language is apparently very strong and I offend people, but I'm just not aware of that. And maybe if the machine would tell me, hey, this sounds quite angry, Mm -hmm. And or at least a native speaker would understand it as an angry thing. Um, then maybe I would just yeah retrieve my message, edit it, and then try to be nice. No, hundred percent, exactly. And I guess you have that kind of tension between like you know obviously uh, switching between being formal and informal as well, because sometimes obviously the way you can communicate something, yeah, it might, it might come overly formal. Whereas I mean you know that that might just be your natural way of communicating maybe. Um, that's that's quite an interesting one. And then on on the note of emojis, um, which is quite interesting, sometimes you have a tension between text and emojis, right? So for example, the emojis might, you know, for example, a smiley face with maybe passive aggressive text. Um, what's the tension between that and then AI as well? Yes, so that's the new ones that the AI doesn't understand, and that's mm -hmm. in our uh, future work recommendations. So that's that the first point that I had in the data structure complexity of emotions. Um, the AI doesn't really detect nuances and it doesn't really detect the context. So the problem was that the results or like um, the information that, that we would retrieve from the server would be about a particular message without mm -hmm. understanding what has been sent before. Mm -hmm. and, and so that it lacks the contextual uh, understanding and it lacks the, the nuance. So um, yeah, that's something that unless you know you can create your own algorithm. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I guess the, Google would be on the way to do that. Um, the, the IBM Watson is, is not as smart as, as we would like it to be. Amazing. And Kiara was asking, uh, will we be able to have these slides to see the results clearly? I can send you the paper once it's published. Hopefully mm -hmm. it will be published at the end of March Amazing. officially. And mm -hmm. then you have all the details. That's brilliant. Yeah, so Kiara and all these other participants, um, it'll be great to obviously uh, read through the, the publication. So um, as soon as that's uh, out and published, um, it's, it's in the Kai conference, isn't it? Yeah, so it will be an ACM library as a just um, late breaking works or something. Amazing. Uh, but yeah, it will be accessible. So like if you have the academic email, mm -hmm. you can log into the library and then get that. Brilliant. So you guys will all be able to download and read that. Paper. Yeah, I could send you now, but like I still wait for them to like really confirm that this that this is true. I got the DOI number of uh, already, which is quite exciting. But yeah, I'll share it as soon as I um, I have it officially in the library. Amazing. And Charles uh, Mortim is asking: When you've conducted your study on pe on people's use of Moody Man and Slack, were there any findings that surprised you, or were very different from what you expected? Hmm. Yeah. So the one that I think I, I said that multiple times. The one that surprised me was how much people care about themselves. Uh, this is something that I didn't um, really thought uh, about. So this is like a terminology that I wasn't aware during my PhD, impression formation. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's from psychology, basically. So the, similarly to the previous study, when I was doing remote working, um, the surprise was this organizational ident identification, which is clearly from organizational science, organizational behavior from management. So if you go to business schools, they all talk about identification and organizational identity and things like that. But in the design study, we don't talk about that. Like it's like, what is that even? So this is the time when doing a study that is based on design, uh, I somehow, suddenly now turning into management because I have to study identification 
and you know resignation and all of the stuff. And similar here, we're doing a tech study that is clearly for a computer science conference. And I suddenly just been jumped into psychology, like how we care about our image, our impression, and how do we form it even uh, through text communication. So that's that's my biggest surprise, and and actually the most um, intriguing one because I think it's very interesting to see like. Uh, Actually, maybe it's not about, you know, like from my previous study, it was like, oh, we cannot learn about attitudes. We cannot learn about mood. It's not about, we don't want to learn about other people's attitude. We want to learn about our own attitude and how do we come across. So it's kind of like a shift between like uh, more self-centered instead of like, oh, I want to like get to know my colleague. No, do you want to know like how you come across. So that's that's what's my support. And then different from what I expected is that my expectation was like everyone would want, because following literature review, everyone would want the feedback to be after. And of course, I was like, no, we want it before. And that's completely against all the papers that came out from Microsoft last year, because everyone is talking about like this post meeting feedback dashboards. And now my paper is saying there's no such thing as post meeting dashboard because no one cares after the meeting. Uh, so that's something that Amazing. I really enjoyed. A, a question coming in from Rod Cook. Uh, Rod's asking, what's the future of the app? Like, what's the next steps in terms of both the research and the application? Uh, no, there, there is no future. <laughs> no, uh, I'm, I'm kidding. Um, no, I think eventually I would like to um, use this. Um, at least flow and integrate it into a solution. I work for a different company called Mana Search, and we um, working in the recruitment space. And I really want to kind of leverage on that study and really understand how people um, portray themselves during um, interviews to work. Because I think, uh, and this is quite of like a big space right now, but. You know, people lie at interviews a lot, like 80% of CVs are apparently with lies. And if you go on the, especially now when we're interviewing on Zoom a lot, so there's like a lot of solutions when you can see that people are reading on screens. Um, I kind of want to apply that and see like if we can really improve the whole recruitment process um, so that we avoid resignation before even this happens. So we don't really hire the wrong person that is not uh, well culturally match to the organization and you know every uh, resignation costs on average 30,000 pounds so if someone leaves the organization this is how much it costs the organ because you have to rehire a new person you have to train the person who wasted the salary of the person so it is a costly thing and if we can just avoid that and and really try to hire people that are culturally better fit uh, and then leverage this sentiment and emotion detection, then yeah, possibly that that could be like, for me, it's, it's more like a future within the recruitment space. Amazing. And a question coming in from Torvidas. Torvidas is asking, what was your motivation to start the PhD? Mm -hmm. um, to be honest. <laughs> uh, I was pregnant um, and I just, thought that I can't go back to a corporate or any organization and work nine to five. So I thought that uh, I like to have some flexibility in my job, which was basically PhD because you can do PhD around the clock. You can, uh, you can work on Christmas, you can work at 8 p.m. Doesn't really matter. Um, so so it's, it's a flexible job. It's actually the longest, the longest work I ever had in my life. So I usually like would stay max three years in any organization. PhD is like four and a half. So it is a big work actually. Like you're signing a contract for four and a half years to stay in one organization in one research question. It's depressive and it's frustrating, um, but it has, the, so it has a trade-off. Like you are devoting half a decade on one research question, but on the other hand, you have a flexibility. And I thought that as a young mom, that's something that I, I really was looking towards. So, and the most exciting thing about my PhD is like I finally found something that merged the two words that I was studying before. So kind of tech and creativity. So we were in design engineering. And, and before for me, like you could see in my background, I was doing economics in economic school, like statistics there. And then 
I was studying pure art in the art university, but I could never like put these two things together. And finding design engineering was kind of like a blessing because I was like, oh my God, I'm doing these both things together. And, uh, and it was just fun. So I think uh, it's, 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 a, it's amazing domain to study design engineering. So very jealous that you guys could do it, not, you know, not where you were so old as me and then finally found it, but you can do it earlier. Totally agree, totally agree. And Akira's asked, I'm mentioning, it's really interesting. She loves the research um, that you've undertaken. And is there anywhere that we can look into the research study further? Like she's really interested in understanding more. So she's asking like, you know, um, any suggested reading besides obviously your paper that's coming out in a month mm -hmm. or so? Yeah, <coughs> there is a lot of, I mean, if you mm, see my paper, there's a lot of studies about basically affective recognition. So Microsoft did one last year for Kai, uh, for the video conferencing. Uh, I am basically against AI myself. I do think that, so again, if we go back to recruitment, you can see that AI is biased and I do not believe that there is a solution to solve that. I don't think that AI should replace recruitment because um, if we used to recruit people with judgments, let's say uh, racist, all these kind of issues that we have, um, AI is at the end of the day trained on previous data. So if AI is trained on human decisions, it will always be biased. So it's really for me like a mystery if someone is trying to do ethical AI because I don't believe in this, I don't think it's complete bullshit. So I'm more like thinking that how can we leverage AI like in a nice way, but not really think that we can replace everything with that. So yeah, I, I personally recommend doing some readings within anything that is um, criticizing AI to really understand, like really find evidence for that. Uh, there's another study in Cornell University that they compared all the AI recruitment uh, solutions and they found out that it's all black magic and there is like no accuracy, there is no data backing that. So um, I think interesting to, to find to read more about that. and. You might find that in IEEE a lot in the conference. Um, the sky is a bit um, glamorizing AI. So I think IEEE is more toned down. Um, my other interesting study that I want to do that came up from this, and this is not revealed in this paper, is <coughs> I also asked my participant to use threads in Slack. So um, whenever they were ideating, uh, I wanted them to use the thread, which surprisingly uh, half of them didn't even know how to use threads what what is it like how does it work and my aim was to check whether threads would help people in selection because when we look into design studies i also am against just studying ideation i think like whatever like it's great ideation but at the end of the day we need to select ideas and that's more challenging so i really try to think if this participants are able to select one winning idea at the end of the study through using the threads. And what happened is, uh, and that's something that really uh, I'm excited about, is I was able to match uh, in the framework that threads can play the same function as post-its. Uh, if you really think about all the information that we're trying to convey, or organizing features, threads are doing the same as spots. So if we don't have mirror boards, if we don't have whiteboards physically, we can actually use text communication and using threads and organize our thoughts, organize our um, our ideation process, and then we can say goodbye to post-its. So that's something that I'm trying to do in the next study. Yeah, super interesting. Um, and then what's cool? Uh, Adam was asking uh, the, the, the name behind the app, uh, Mood Ma Moody Man. So um, uh, interesting thing there in terms of uh, the choice of name and uh, I guess the, the in, in terms of uh, bias and gender stereotypes. What was the meaning uh, behind Moody Man? <coughs> it's a DJ from Detroit. Yeah. yeah. If you, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's a song from Drake, and I think. Um, Drake sampled a part from a DJ session of that guy from the 90s. And I just found that it sounds quite nice, Moody Man. And um, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of like your good uncle that you can ask him 
and he's quite moody and then you can ask him like how your message sounds like so yeah that, that was just the, there's nothing behind it apart from like techno music behind the name amazing no no acronyms or nothing like that right <laughs> amazing uh, mimi a uh, fantastic talk and q a as well thank you for both the time and the talk um it was super interesting um and and guys uh, the links to the research will definitely follow by email communication guys so details of, of the talk and uh, mimi were sent to your emails as well so definitely feel free to browse and connect and to conclude, thank you, Mimi, for taking out your time and joining us tonight. It was super informative, really interesting and, and thought-provoking as well. So thank you. Thank you for all the questions. Thank you for having me. Amazing. Great. And to all of the participants and attendees you've joined tonight, to all staff, students, alumni, we really look forward to seeing you again next week. So keep an eye out on your emails for the details of the next speaker and the links to the next talk. And until next week, guys, stay well, stay safe, and thank you, guys. Bye, guys. Good evening.